Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our third week of Entrepreneurship 101. Tonight's uh, topic is different types of entrepreneurship. And we decided to start with a story of the entrepreneurs. We have a video series called Meet the Entrepreneurs that uh, was just talking about one of our social innovator innovation clients. And we'll be talking a, a bit more about social innovation tonight. But before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to bring your attention to an upcoming event we have actually next Monday. It's a Mars Best Practices series, and it's on branding. <clears throat> it's called Successful Branding, Connect with Your Audience. And even if you're in your very early stages of your startup, branding and communicating with your audience via social media, as you saw in the video, or other, other uh, platforms and ways of communicating is very important. So if you're interested in that event, if you go to the marsdd.com slash events um, section of the website, you can register there. So I'm really delighted to, to, to welcome tonight two of the Mars leadership, they, they, Tony Redpath and Allison Hewitt. And they, they really um, represent the wide range of companies that we work um, with here at Mars. So Tony Redpath is actually very excited to be back on the Entrepreneurship 101 stage because he is a longtime supporter of Entrepreneurship 101 as one of the co-founders. He, uh, he is currently VP Partner Programs at Mars, where he ensures that Mars' growing suite of external and in internal programs work swiftly together to help entrepreneurs. He also advises entrepreneurs and high growth companies, particularly in environmental advanced materials and manufacturing markets. He has a PhD in chemistry that he's very proud of. He loves chemists, so if there's any chemists in the audience, he'll be your new best friend. And he's a beekeeper on the side. Our second speaker, and actually they're going to be uh, presenting together, is Alison Hewitt. Alison is the uh, Director of Social Entrepreneurship at Mars. She also leads the Social Innovation Generation, or SIG at Mars, team. Her, work, wor her team works on a broad range of projects, from not-for-profits interested in revenue generation to entrepreneurs committed to social transformation. She brings considerable expertise in the public sector, including the introduction of 211 and several award-winning innovations. So you'll see that they'll cover off very well the, the broad range of entrepreneurs of entrepreneurship ventures that you can start from social innovation to high tech uh, companies. So welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming in the rain. We appreciate it and hope you're not too wet. <laughs> okay. So I have to uh, add to that introduction. If Allison is here for the social entrepreneurs as a chemist geek, I'm here for the anti-social entrepreneurs. Yeah, he has to put the emphasis in the right place, right? Yes, the yes. Anti-social entrepreneur as opposed yes. to the anti-social entrepreneur, which we will have none of. We will mm -hmm. have none of that. I got my knuckles wrapped for that. <laughs> OK, so what this is, OK. Now we're really starting back to basics. Last week you had some excitement from the tales of, uh, from the, uh, sort of from the battlefield from Dave. Um, we now want to get into sort of more of the meat and potatoes. And, and this is really just an overview of the different ways you can create a business. Now I seem to recall from last week, over half of you have a company. I, I think that's about right. And the rest of you are considering one. So for some of you, you may have already made the decisions about some of the things we're going to talk about, but it doesn't hurt to, to go back uh, through them. So um, what did I do with the clicker? Uh, here we are. Um, so uh, yes, what message are you sending out as to what it is you're in business to do? Uh, so start with the basics. Great, so um, you saw the video from a socially innovative organization called Small Change Fund. So they're thinking about how we do philanthropy differently, right? So you know, you think about direct mail and um, you think about corporations giving money or grants. So they're thinking about how to do that differently. How many in this audience would say that the venture that they're thinking of has a double or triple bottom line, i.e., you want to make money, but you also want to make a social and or environmental impact? Okay, great. How many of you just want to make money? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, bye bye. I'm out of here. No, I'm just kidding. It's, yeah. okay. it's really good. We're going to help you do both. But you know, I would challenge one of the things that studies have shown is even the entrepreneurs who say, I'm here to make money, actually, for many of them, the motivation is really, I want to see my idea get put into practice. And that's a huge driver. Making money, yes, but that sense of satisfaction of taking your idea and getting out there is often a key reason for starting your business. Absolutely. So why do you want to start the business? What is your motivation? Single bottom line, double bottom line, triple bottom line. You should understand that because it's going to guide the decisions that you make going forward. What resources do you need? Are you happy to work out of the basement? Do you need a corporate space? Are you looking for a hotel space here? And there's a huge trend right now around hubs or shared spaces, co-working kind of facilities such as the one pictured here. Labs, Tony, we share lab yes. space here for people. But you know, if, if you have an idea for a new cancer drug, you are not going to bootstrap that from your garage. Okay, that is a, a potentially $500 million venture before it gets to the marketplace. So, you know, what resources you need obviously tie back up to that first line. What are you attempting to achieve? And that very much determines the pathway that you follow uh, in order to get your business to succeed. And so as, as, you, as we think about people who come in to meet with us, very often people are very passionate about their idea so we ask them you know is it unique has someone done this before and the probability that someone has is pretty great so we try to encourage you to get some market intelligence and think about that or as Tony will say there's a reason no one has done it before Yes. <laughs> Those anti-gravity machines just don't work. So, um, so, and that again leads into how do you fit into the rest of the world? Um, as an investor in a fund I was involved in used to say, the world works. Um, and that is fundamentally true. It may not work perfectly. And so a lot of what we see, whether it is social, financially driven, is finding a way to make it work better. But it's getting along without you right now in your idea. So what have you got that fits in? Who do you displace? That's your competitor. To whom are you complementary? You cannot launch your business without understanding what I like to think of as an ecosystem that you have to fit into and understand where you are going to fit in. Because if you don't understand that, you do not know who's going to come along and crush you because you're a competitor. And just like in nature, uh, you're stealing their food, they're not going to be very tolerant. So, um, and even the social venture groups do that. Oh, vicious. It's, ah, <laughs> it, 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 there is competition. There is competition for mind share. There is competition for attention. So you have, yes, you've got a great idea, but do you really understand where you are going to fit into the rest of the world? And that is essential. And so we have a lot of people come to us and say, here's what I want to do. Um, want to make money, want to make a difference. I don't know the appropriate corporate structure. I could just go for a for-profit. I could go for a non-profit or a charity. Are there some hybrids? Are there organizations that actually exist in this messy space in the middle? And actually, that's where most of our clients are. And what about cooperatives? Uh, cooperatives are a very interesting model. And this is actually International Year of the Cooperative coming up. So it's very interesting uh, to think about that model model, worker co-ops, other kinds of things. So although your tendency may be one corporate structure, we encourage you to think about others and what's the right structure to achieve the end goal that you want. It's also the International Year of Chemistry, should you wish to know, according to the United Nations. And it is the international, uh, it, sorry, it is the Year of the Entrepreneur, as declared by our federal government. There you go. There Good you year. go. You're in the right place. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the organizational spectrum. So we have historically thought about 
charities on one side, like the Red Cross, who are just taking grants and donations. That's a, a grant funded nonprofit and sometimes a charity. Mars, for example, is a nonprofit charitable organization. As you move along that spectrum, there are some nonprofits that revenue generate. So think about the soccer club. Uh, they charge fees, right? Any kind of recreational organization. They're not necessarily a social enterprise, but they exist through charging fees. I'm going to go to the other end now, where there's a traditional business like CIBC. Well, they often are engaged in what we call corporate social responsibility. So one of the things they support is the CIBC Run for the Cure, right? You've probably heard about that. That's a really strong brand for them. And that's about corporations making money, but giving back in a way that's not necessarily related to their mission. Then they have this sort of social purpose business and in the middle is social ventures. So my job is to put pressure on both ends of the spectrum to get charities and nonprofits to think about their sustainability beyond relying on grants and to get for-profits to think about how they can create a business model that's got a social and environmental impact aside from just writing a check. So this messy space in the middle we call social ventures and there's organizations like Fifth Town Cheese, which is a small organization. It's a dairy, but it's all organic. They've got lead standards. They go through the whole gamut from an environmental and a social point of view. Her social and environmental mission is as important as her financial mission. She was incorporated with this double or triple bottom line. And it's an interesting evolution because a century ago, I think we had what I would call a serial model. The Roosevelt's made a ton of money and then created a foundation. And my memory's blanking on me in the library, um, guys. Um, um, Carnegie. Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie. Steel mills, okay? Make as much money as you can selling steel to the railroads and then retire, create a foundation, and the Carnegie Foundation um, helped create over a thousand libraries. If you were a small town, you could apply to the foundation, they would give you the money to build a library. You just had to commit to pay the librarian and buy books. So that was a serial model. Make out like a bandit, and then give back. And I think it's, it's interesting that we've evolved now to let's do this simultaneously. And um, I fully confess I'm all for that. Great. And there are, just to, out of interest, there's a lot of youth in particular who come to see us and say, I'm actually not interested in working like crazy on Bay Street, making money and giving back later. I'm kind of interested in living and working my values. So it is absolutely. Um, a bit of a tidal wave. And of course, you know, I'm a hammer, so everything's a nail, right? So that's the kind of world that I see, and recognizing that there are those who are just interested in making money, but I do hope you'll think about the Carnegie's. I have a Carnegie library in my neighborhood in High Park, so. Mm -hmm. it, it does work, just a different model. So, starting, we've arbitrarily divided uh, the world up into three types of organizations, and we're just going to quickly go through the different types. Um, again, for some of you already, the die is cast, you already know what you're doing, maybe this will help you rethink. Consulting. Um, it's really you selling you at, at its uh, basic level. You come out with a particular, say, technical expertise, and you, you sell your advice. Um, these days, there are a lot of virtual consulting agencies where you have one skill, you have a colleague has a complementary skill, and together you create a much larger virtual uh, consulting uh, organization that on the website looks like it's huge. In fact, it's 10 people operating out of their basement. You can go from there to something like Hatch Associates, professional consulting agencies with their own 
building in Sheridan Park. Um, and so there and, are... Yeah, in, there's a couple that specialize in the not-for-profit sector or the social venture space. I just met with a, a group um, who are called The Moment who are doing uh, consulting around transformational change, uh, working with organizations to do multi-sectoral collaboration leading to transformative change. So there's a lot of uh, groups that specialize in this sector, in this field. And one of the question we, questions we frequently get asked is, well, how do we set our rates? And the answer is, well, how much are they willing to pay? Um, fundamentally, when you offer consulting services, you always look at the alternative that your client has. And the alternative is to hire someone. That means someone full-time and all the costs, but that sets a comparative cost. You only have to undercut that. Don't say, oh, well, I only charge $500 a day and it's two days, so it'll be 1000 Look at the, the, the comparative cost that it would take to do it via an alternative means. Sell by value, not on cost. And that, that's a generalism that I'll give you, that uh, if the alternative is $10,000, you only have to charge nine to make you cost competitive. So that's my general advice in, in how to price your consulting uh, fees. And you only have to look to lawyers to know how to price things highly. I'm sure there's lawyers here. They are necessary and there are some that we love. But <laughs> advantages uh, to consulting, it is a low capital cost business. It can be just you, you know, you need some letterhead and ability to bill. Um, um, and, uh, you know, the ability to get to clients' offices to work with them. So it doesn't take a lot of money to get yourself up um, and in business. Word of advice, uh, if, if you are giving advice, make certain you have liability insurance. Because if someone pays you for your advice and you are wrong, and you touted yourself as a professional, then they're going to say, I paid you because you were supposed to know, and your advice just cost me, you know, a potential million dollar business and I'm suing you. So liability insurance is a good idea. Any engineer, consulting engineer knows that. Uh, it just kind of goes with the ter territory. That's why lawyers and accountants all have professional uh, insurance. And I think one of the things sometimes, working from your basement alone, you don't have a lot of support. Um, it can get lonely down there, uh, which is why something other than virtual, I think, sometimes makes sense. Yeah, and even in boards of directors of nonprofits, we encourage people to get directors and officers liability insurance. It's an additional coverage. It's not a lot of money, and it's absolutely worth the peace of mind. Service with a smile. <laughs> um, this is your organization delivering a service to another. Um, a shoeshine uh, business is a fundamental, is your basic service industry. Um, banks offer a service, okay? They will say they sell you products. Really, they are selling you services. They will lend you money. They will manage your money. These are all services that they do using other people's money for you and charging you for this. Um, and I should have mentioned uh, that CIBC is indeed a sponsor uh, of this course and we love them, which is why we're using their logo. Uh, and that's another thing you must always remember to put, feature your sponsors prominently, <laughs> but discreetly, of course. Um, these days, uh, there are outfits like um, Salesforce.com. The sort of the web has given us the power to offer distributed services, you know, cloud storage, um, uh, services online, SaaS. Um, okay, these are all service businesses that take things that you you don't need to do yourself. You can do them using an online provider, and that has opened up a whole new area of service businesses away from um, you know lab services where you know capital costs can be really high you got to buy equipment many university grads actually uh, piggyback a service business on the lab that they have graduated from because they they buy access to very expensive equipment that is not fully utilized 
uh, utilize it without having to put out that capital cost. Uh, and as long as that's all up and above board, that's an effective, that's a cost effective way of offering lab services. Um, and Salesforce.com will give out 10 free licenses to not-for-profits. So if you're starting up and you're in that space, it's a great way to manage your uh, customer relationship software. That's essentially what it's meant to do. Um, Mars uses it here. And also something I'm going to talk about a little bit later on is uh, B corporations or benefit corporations, which again are corporations that have a double or triple bottom line. And they are negotiating various uh, deals with groups like Salesforce who will provide you 10 free licenses again if you're in the uh, social purpose space, not necessarily nonprofit. So we'll talk about B Corps a bit later. Um, so, okay, so some social enterprise service models, some more examples, I guess. Yeah, so let's just talk about courier services for just a second. So, Away Express is a not for profit organization, and they employ people with mental health issues, and you may see them riding the TTC because that's how they deliver packages. And it's a, a very specific business model. So, lots of times, people with mental health issues, particularly if they're on medication, they're not necessarily so great early in the morning. So this kind of organization provides supports that say, no, we actually don't deliver your packages first thing in the morning, but they work with vendors who are prepared to accept that, so not necessarily the banks who need it there right away. The next group is called Turnaround Couriers, and they employ youth right out of youth shelters. That's how they employ them. But they decided to incorporate as a for-profit and try this out. And they're very proud of the fact that they've never lost a package, and I really hope one day someone in the audience like this doesn't say, oh yeah, they lost my package, but <laughs> as of today, I haven't heard that they have, and so they are bike couriers, that's how they get around. Um, there's an organization called Good Foot Couriers, which employs people with developmental disabilities. And the reason I want to talk, so that's three courier services here in Toronto that employ uh, people with various uh, levels of, say, mental health issues or developmental disability or um, homeless or street-involved youth. And we have another social purpose business called Tiffin Day. So essentially, this woman walked into our office, said, I have a Tiffin, which is these boxes from India. I want to do organic lunches because my kids lunch is really terrible and I hate all the garbage and so she wanted to develop a system where she would deliver it in the Tiffins and then the next day someone would pick them up well she's using Goodfoot Courier so this is a match of two clients she's using Goodfoot Couriers to pick up the Tiffins the next day so employing it so it's that kind of thinking about things in a whole different way where there's a social and environmental mission but also everybody's interested in the bottom line because you've all got to pay the rent you've all got to pay your staff you've got to make sure that even though it's non-profit, it doesn't mean you're not for profit. Believe me, you are. It's just what you do with that profit, which is to reinvest it in the business. Um, profiled over here is a guy called John Mighton, runs an organization called Jump Math, Junior Undiscovered Math Prodigy. Uh, John is a uh, terrific mathematician, but didn't start out that way. He's a PhD, and this is a scene from Goodwill Hunting. If you remember that movie, he's a math consultant on Goodwill Hunting. Um, but he started out struggling and sort of realized it was how he was being taught. And so it's developed a whole system to teach kids, particularly kids with learning disabilities, how to do math better. And so we're working with him not only to sell math workbooks, Books, but to actually challenge how we educate kids. How do we create a numerate society? So in addition to social entrepreneurs, we're working with social innovators. And we even have folks who are intrapreneurs who are working within their particular institutions to make change. And I'm sure many of you in this audience are intrapreneurs. And I think that touches on something that is key when we think of innovation, we often think of a new technology. Um, innovation in business models is equally important. And we see that in, in all of our, the di different disciplines that, um, that we deal with here at Mars. And, and Steve Jobs, uh, the late Steve Jobs, will be a classic example because the whole iTunes model uh, sort of revolutionized that industry. And that is both enabled by the cool devices, uh, but also by a very clever, totally new business 
model. So again, you don't necessarily, I think what we're saying is no matter what the type of business, it's not just about, well, yeah, I've got a, a, a new technology. It's also, is there a really new way of delivering something, a product or a, a service? So products and you know, most of you aren't old enough to know what this is referring to, but Allison and I are. That's the Fuller Brush Man that uh, um, doesn't exist anymore, I don't yeah. think. So products, okay, that runs the full gamut of everything from General Motors, um, RIM, to people making custom local one-off products. Um, the key, obviously, a tangible offering. Um, examples, so in classically, um, the challenge is here, uh, you have to develop your product. So you got to make something um, and uh, find out that it doesn't work and then make another one and make a succession of some things until one of them actually works and get them in the hands of a customer. Um, that can cost money. Um, you know, I gave the example of uh, pharma. Well, it takes a long time to take a new drug to market. The same on new pesticides, thinking of chemicals close to my heart. Um, uh, so you have to worry about issues. Who makes this? Do you make it here? Do you make it offshore? Um, these are the types of businesses that can scale hugely and look at RIM and despite all of their challenges, you know, this is a billion dollar company, let's not forget that. Product companies, I mean, that I think is what makes them attractive. Uh, as many service companies, it is often challenging to scale a service company. Uh, online, yes, you can, but if it involves couriering, then you have to set up something if you start in one city, you got to set up a copy in the next city and then a copy in the next city. So that's a model that, that can be challenging to scale. Whereas if I can make one mid widget and I know I can make money on it, I can scale that to many millions. Uh, so, um, and some, uh, so, okay, so over to you I some of the other Can you go back to the other one for just a second? Um, yes. Is anybody think, a member yes. of Bixie? Anybody? Yes. A few of you, great. So so one of the business models here um, is that they pre-sold you. So before they came to Toronto, they pre-sold memberships. So this is one way to generate revenue. Uh, we often talk about you know grants and donations or, or venture capital, or angels. But one way is to think about advance payment uh, from your customers. And the Bixie is absolutely a, a social innovation. And I just wanted to talk a few about a few more. So the next, yeah. uh, next one, thank you. Just a few uh, products, uh, Restore. Uh, people know Habitat for Humanity, um, so they have a lot of extra materials that get donated. So instead of putting them in the landfill, they actually set up a store. And so if I'm going to renovate my house and I'm looking for a door, I can go there um, as opposed to or in addition to shopping at Home Depot or whatever. Um, Me to We is the uh, social enterprise attached to Free the Children. So that's the Kielbergers program. And 50% uh, of the proceeds of the Me to We products go back to the Kielbergers. But Me to We is actually a for profit. And we do lots of events here at Mars, and you'll see the, the SIG or social innovation generation folk wearing those kind of t shirts. Um, you could buy your mom a nice ball from a place called Inspiration Studios, which supports homeless women and does job training around pottery kinds of skills. Or another one of our clients is Ella Botanicals, which you'll see in lots of health food stores. So these are all products that have a social and or environmental mission as well as absolutely striving to the bottom line. So. Um this leads to money, as all things often do. Um, no matter what you're starting, you know, you probably are going to need some form of money to launch your venture. It's just the amount that's in question. And so I wanted to touch briefly on, on the different forms of financing, because I think we find it's an area that people don't really understand. And um, people who will give you money 
depending on which category they're in, their behavior will be very different. So really, you know, basic debt, equity, bootstrapping, or fundraising. So debt. So borrowing from someone, you know, using it, an asset as security. Uh, and it's difficult sometimes for those in the social purpose space to get those debts. So there are new intermediaries emerging because you don't often have the kind of secured assets to get the money from the bank. And, um, you know, that's often for startups, that is often characterized as the three F's, friends, family, and fools. Uh, the people to whom you go and say, I got a great idea, will you lend me $10,000? Uh, equity, um, equity is very different. You sell a piece of the action, and we're gonna get onto a little bit of an example, but um, you sell a piece of the action to someone, you don't have to repay them, but they're now your partner. And again, your first line is friends, family, and fools um, before you reach out to others. And we'll get to the others in a moment. So bootstrapping. Uh, so again, this is self-funding, right? Reinvesting all the profits for growth. And I would probably say most of the early stage entrepreneurs that come to see us are in the bootstrapping stage. And I think uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op is a wonderful example. It started as a group of climbers who were you know, annoyed at being ripped off on uh, poor quality climbing gear and formed a co-op uh, really to serve themselves uh, with better equipment. And after 40 years, uh, still a co-op, a huge retail success, um, but they reinvest the profits and when they get above a certain level, they dividend it out to the members and your dividend is proportional to how much you spent. And I can tell you, it's nice to get a $150 check from Mountain Equipment Co-op until you realize how much you must have spent there in order to get that much of a dividend. That's the horrifying thought, but a, a truly successful co-op model. And uh, you know, Desjardins uh, Co-op is a huge financial institution, particularly in Quebec. So co-ops are, are not necessarily small housing co-ops, they're huge, and Canada's a long history of co-ops. But the thing I want to talk about the most in this section is fundraising. So grants, foundations, government, uh, corporate sponsorship, and then the membership. The problem with grants is you apply for a grant based on the need at the time of applying. By the time you get the grant, the need may be completely different. And there are very few grants just to sustain your organization because you're really nice guys or really nice women and you're doing good work. It doesn't actually work that way. You get very specific project funding that doesn't often give you the flexibility that you need. So it is our perspective that what you need to do is diversify your income base as much as possible, but look at what grants and opportunities are available to you from government, foundations, corporations, all the way up down the line. And I would add in here, if you're coming from a university or a research hospital with an idea, you are uniquely positioned to really actually incubate and, and develop your idea using research funding. Uh, and I strongly advise you to do that because you can, you can de-risk the opportunity and move it ahead using non-dilutive as in, you don't ever have to pay it back, you, no one owns any stock in you, uh, as you develop this underpinning science before you transition out into a company. So that is obviously only valid to those of you who are coming out of a research institution, but it, it gives you a unique, unique advantage. The downside is you're probably dealing with much earlier stage technology and you need all the advantage that you can get. Um, so, uh, just a quick primer on the difference between debt and equity. Debt, um, someone lends you money, they get paid back first. You have to service the debt and pay interest, and when you get enough money, you will pay the debt back. Uh, before you get any dividends, uh, debt is typically a first charge on some asset. And in a startup company, you probably don't have any assets. And so they will uh, then um, uh, 
can't secure it with an asset of yours, your house, your car. And the irony, we had a speaker last year, who's actually a margin, who had created his company, went to the bank and tried to borrow $20,000 for his company and was turned down flat. They said, no, you have no assets, you're starting up. There's no way. So he went back thought about it, came in the next day, made certain he found a different loan manager and said, I'd like to buy 20, 000, I'd like to borrow $20,000 to buy a car. And they said, certainly, of course. And they lent him, which he promptly used to bankroll his company. Um, it, so uh, banks are not there to take risks. Okay, my retirement money is sitting in there. So I don't want them lending to you. You're too risky, okay? Their job is to be very, and, and I'm joking, but we all benefit in Canada from surviving the meltdown because of this conservative nature of our banking business. So they lend against a security. And so, um, you know, whether it's yours or the company's, they're very cautious. The good news about debt is once you've paid it back, you say thank you kindly, goodbye, I don't owe you anything anymore. As opposed to equity, equity, on the other hand, never has to be repaid. But the minus is you keep on paying forever. And one of the things we advise clients at Mars, when you take an equity investment, sometimes it's the most expensive money you could ever get because you are selling a piece of the action and you pay and you pay. And the more successful you are, the more you pay because they're getting a percentage of profits. Okay. When you have an equity uh, investor, you have a partner, okay? They will want a say in the business. A lender typically does not. A lender has certain covenants, they have certain rights. Outside of that, they can't tell you how to run your business. An equity investor is your partner, they can. So as you are deciding how to finance your business, you know, it's really important to choose which pathway you go down, or at least to be aware of the consequences. You may not have a choice. If you can't borrow from anybody, you may have to sell a piece of the action, and you may say, you know, I know it's expensive, but it's the only way to go forward. Be careful who you take on as your partner because they're going to be with you for a long, long time. So again, just a very simple example I call my lemonade stand example. You want to start a lemonade stand and run it for a weekend and you need 20 bucks to launch this little business. You have two choices. You can borrow uh, from uh, your sibling um, or you can take them in as a 50-50 partner. Okay, if it rains and you only get 10 bucks revenue, your lender has first charge and takes that $10, thank you kindly. They've only lost 10 bucks, you got nothing for standing out in the rain for the weekends, okay? If they were your partner, well in fact they lose more because you split the 10 bucks, they get five bucks, you at least got five bucks for your trouble. If it was a reasonable weekend and it was cloudy, you can read the, the numbers there. The lender, they get their 20 bucks back and you at least get 10. If it's a partner, they still lose five bucks. You get 15 if it's really sunny and you sold lemonade as fast as you could make it. The lender still only gets their 20 bucks back and I haven't worried about interest or things. Okay, they were capped at getting that money back and you got 30. In that case, if it was a partner, now they're making money and you're doing pretty well. The message here, lending debt is lower risk. With lower risk, they get less reward. That's the trade-off. Equity is much higher risk. If you look at the, the worst case scenario, they lost a lot more 
um, they lost 15 as opposed to 10 bucks. But once the sun is shining, they're starting to make money. And if you decided to stay open the next weekend, then they'd take half of whatever you made that weekend because they just keep on making that money. Whereas if it was a loan in this simple model, they're capped on the upside. Lenders are more conservative, lower risk, lower reward. So I think that's the message there. Don't go to a bank saying, I want you to back and make an investment in my company, because they just won't do it. They are not that sort of player. They are more risk averse. If you understand what makes them tick, then you can speak their language and you'll have a much better uh, chance of success. So what are the types of financing? And I think we've touched some of them, but in, in social entrepreneurship. Yeah, so you know, first of all, you better be able to put your own money where your mouth is, right? So if you come in and say, I'd like you to invest in my company, and we say, how much have you put in? And you said, I'm not putting my money into this thing. Are you crazy? Well, yeah, I would be crazy if I gave it to you. I'd be in the friends, family, and fool category. So you really have to be able to, to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, the web 2.0 is crowdsourcing, right? So everybody remembers what Obama did, lots and lots of small donations added up to a big win. A little bit about what the small change fund uh, did too. Uh, we also have some intermediaries that are emerging in the space like the Community Forward Fund and the Canadian Alternative Investment Co Cooperative which is um, all the uh, faith-based organizations that come together to create a pool that will lend money to those engaged in social purpose work. And of course, Tony has talked all about the banks. Now, Tony and I in lots of universes, except for Mars, uh, you know, wouldn't be working together. We offer uh, a really different perspective um, on the world. But uh, one thing we both do really well is talk a lot. So we're running behind. And so I just we're gonna, noticed we're that. Gonna so we're going to speed gonna it up a little bit. Yes, yeah, speed it up. So. Okay. So friends, family, and fools, the sources of equity financing. The turkey principle is when you borrow from a family member, you have to sit down for Thanksgiving dinner with them over the turkey. If you have lost that money, it can be a very unpleasant meal. Okay, enough said about the consequences of friends and family. Um, angels, um, high net worth individuals, currently probably one of the best sources of uh, investment in companies right now since the last category venture capital funds have been decimated. There's very few that have any dry powder to invest. Uh, angels really liked, these are folks who have been successful and they like to invest their money back. They tend to do it in areas that they're familiar with, either familiar with or are very interested in. You get many who have made money, say, on, on IT, who want to get into clean tech because they passionately believe in that. A good angel, remember, this is equity, this is a partner. You want more than money. If they're going to be working with you, you want someone who can add value to you from their own experience. Um, and uh, I think that's true no matter what sort of venture. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are on the Mars mailing list, you might have seen that we just announced uh, $1.3 million worth of funding to launch a new Center for Impact Investing. So Impact Investors is a new breed of investor who wants to see both a social and or environmental and financial return. So they don't necessarily want to make tons of money, but instead of just making a donation, which is essentially 100% loss, except for the tax write-off, they're looking to actually um, invest the money that they hope to at least make the capital back. So in order to facilitate the matching of these impact investors with social ventures, uh, we're going to be launching a social venture exchange, or an SVX, and the partner there is the Toronto Stock Exchange. This is new. Uh, it's not even launched yet so you're ahead of the game, but I encourage you folks who are interested in this space to watch these developments. It'll be an interesting place to launch your venture. 
and on the the uh, sort of more conventional side, Mars actually runs an angel breakfast uh, for high net worth individuals. We do it every month. We bring three companies forward. So if you are engaged with Mars and you're ready to be uh, you know ready for prime time uh, to raise capital, then that's an avenue where, um, uh, as I say, high net worth individuals hang out over a breakfast. We'll hear a pitch, and then we try to see if anybody wants to hook up and um, and then uh, sort of help close an investment deal. Venture capital funds, the only thing I will say on there, just be mindful, different funds uh, invest in different things. There are no general purpose funds. Do not go to a clean tech fund if what you're trying to finance is the latest um, Android app. They don't, won't understand it and they won't spend any time on it. People invest where they're comfortable with what they understand. So do your homework if you're going to go to a venture fund. My strong advice, and this is self-serving, come and see the folks at Mars. We know everybody out there with money, or at least most of them. Uh, and we can help say, this is the flavor of what they like, and nah, they probably don't, um, uh, don't really like that. Uh, and if you want to have some fun, go to the Bessemer Partners website uh, and look at their anti-portfolio, which is all the deals that they turned down um, and subsequently regretted. Mm -hmm. And Google is in there. Um, so uh, moving right along, special financing. Again, if you're coming out of academia or research hospital, there are funds to move ideas from academia into a company, proof of principle. Uh, for medical technologies as well as for physical sciences. NRC IRAP uh, provides money to companies for development programs. For that one, you actually have to have some of your own money. Um, and, uh, well, you can go to the websites there, but again, always feel free to touch base with one of us here who can tell you some of the challenges of working with these different organizations. So on the foundation side. So there's an awful lot of foundations in this country, and there's even some uh, foundations like Rockefeller that invest in Canada. And the Rockefeller Foundation is actually one of the founding sponsors of the Center for Impact Investing. But again, if you're looking in that space, uh, I would encourage you to come with us and we can do a bit of a foundation search for you. Canada, Ontario is very lucky to have the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which puts well over $100 million in grants and contributions annually into our community. And uh, and then, of course, there are um, uh, international ones, the big ones like Gates, if you have a proposal for something in the international development space. A lot of this information is on the Mars website. We do have lists of these things, of, of uh, granting agencies and, and of support groups. Uh, also links to venture capital groups, uh, workbooks on how to approach a VC. You'll not only get talks on those in the in this course, but I again encourage you to go to the uh, to the Mars website because there's a vast amount of material that you can teach yourself on there. So. Um, going to move really quickly since we're over time and Carrie's going to chew us out if we keep going too much longer. The financing life cycle. Uh, most ventures go through something like this. Um, you go from a concept, an idea, to a startup. You start growing, you expand. Um, look at that green curve. That's the risk curve. You were high, high risk at the early stage. The process that you were going through is really one of de-risking. And I can tell you, that's the way a venture capitalist looks at it. What can they do to de-risk this opportunity? Um, investment at high risk tends to be fairly low. Uh, being cautious. As the risk goes down, you can start to get more money in, and sooner or later, uh, you get that wonderful red curve of revenues. Okay, risk is quite a bit uh, down there. Now you're talking about growth. That often now takes, for every $10 that it took to get started, you put 100 in to grow it, because you're investing more and more, but at least you're doing it, earning revenues. So keep that in mind, that this is the life cycle that you have to live with. Think about that when 
at, so look at that yellow curve. It starts off real small, but that's cumulative investment. When you say to your family, I only need $20,000, what happens six months from then? You know, I need another 50. Um, are they tapped out? Um, if so, have they just lost? $20,000, think in, you know, again, we'll get into lectures talking about crossing the chasm. Okay, there is this huge chasm you have to get across to be profitable. Are you building a bridge or are you building a plank? People walk off planks and fall down. Um, be sure that you know how much it will take. So look at that curve and say, I need 20,000 now, but if I'm successful, I'm going to need more. What's my plan? Doesn't mean you don't start out on it, but don't pull up short and say, oh dear, I need more money. Um, you will not be popular. Another thing that will, not, will make you very unpopular is that curve. Um, that is true of so many ventures. Everybody is optimistic. The world will love this, uh, and everybody's going to buy it, and they won't. If that's the likely course, you're much better to go with this model, which is more of a bootstrap. Small amount of investment, plow back in with small revenues, a little bit more investment, and grow slowly but steadily. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think we're five minutes over time. Um, and yeah, I think this is our closing slide, yeah. just about. We're just going to talk about a couple of elements of risk. And you know, Tony mentioned it on the risk reward slide. Tony, you can flip. And, and I can flip. Everybody can. You know, you guys can read this. This is available online. We really just tried to talk about the different categories of risk. Those columns can be much longer. They're really just the top level. Think about the risks. Think about how to make your venture succeed. You have to keep reducing each of those levels of risk. You may not do them all at the same time. You may first do technology. Then you may do market. Execution risk is that big question. Can you actually do this? Have you got what it takes? And that, I think, is a good uh, segue into what we'll be talking about next week, which is what you need to build around your company to be sure that you address all of the execution risks mm -hmm. that are out there. So the final slide, I just want to point this out, is I've, I've been talking a lot about this blended value space. Can you flip it, Tony? I think there's there we are, yes. And so you know, I talked about these B corporations, which are certified, uh, and actually in the US, it's legislation now. Uh, L3C stands for Low Profit Limited Liability Corporation. In the UK, they have something called KICs, or Community Interest Companies. These are all legal structures that recognize this blended value space. Canada does not have any of these, and we're doing a lot of work in this space. What you have to remember, it's a constant battle between mission and money. And you have to decide if you're a mission first or a money first organization, and you have to view all your risks and all your opportunities, weigh them against each of those. And it's quite a challenge, and a lot of folks in the social enterprise space have to work that out. So for example, do we make this auditorium available to you for Entrepreneurship 101 at no charge, which doesn't bring us any, any revenue, or do we rent it out to General Electric who will pay for it? We have to balance those decisions every time. Our mission against the money. So that's the kind of thing that you have to think about in this space. And Anti-social entrepreneurs <laughs> do not have that challenge, I that's have right. to say. <laughs> uh, and so now we're going to just have a little bit of time for questions, but Tony and I are also willing to stick around um, and take your questions one-on-one -on -one as well. But if anybody has any questions. And please use the mics uh, again, just so that folks who are, are online can hear the questions. Uh, and thank I, you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add one one thing that Tony and Allison are only able to touch on financing, which is a huge, uh, of huge importance to entrepreneurs. And we have a number of other lectures um, about working with VCs, about bootstrapping, etc. That will be very helpful to you, as we know money is a huge. Uh, 
is a huge factor in this building a business. This was a teaser. This was a teaser. And as well as when they were talking about the risks of different um, ventures, we do have Meet the Entrepreneur sessions in different sectors where they can talk about the specific challenges in those sectors. So if there are there any questions for Allison or Tony? Can you go to the mic just for the webcast? There's just a mic in the... Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just wonder, when we talk about that, uh, are we going to have another lecture talk about the tax issues? Because uh, I remember like the small entrepreneur, uh, small business, they have a lower tax. Uh, we will touch, Do, we're yeah, going to talk we'll, a little bit about uh, shred credits, uh, which, is, it, which is tied into tax. Uh, because it is, it's handled by Canada Revenue Agency. So yeah, we, we will talk a, a, a bit about that. We, will, we do not talk about um, you know, sort of tax planning, whether you should own your company personally or through mm -hmm. a family foundation. Um, the, the advice there is talk to a lawyer. Okay, uh, that, there is no general advice uh, there. And also, I have one question. Maybe it's a little bit, you know, related to my own issue because I'm an international student. I just wonder, like an international student, if we register a company, can we? Is that accessible? Will we register as the foreign investors, or will we register as a, like wow, normal? That company? that's really. I honestly don't know. We can go offline, and we can. That's something where you're really going to have to talk to a lawyer. But there is a law firm that has free advice on Tuesdays. They should be able to address that pretty quickly. I honestly don't know that. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, just a simple question. It's kind of a basic question, but I think it's a question a lot of people do have, especially if you're uh, running a business or running a new organization. So while you're chasing funding and you've invested what you've invested into it, you know, there's, all, there's only a limited pool. So what is a typical thing that you see people doing as far as uh, you know, keeping food on the table until you get funding? Um, sometimes it takes, it could take six months to get your first round of funding. It takes lesser or more time. Um, so what do you do as an entrepreneur? Do you, like, you know, uh, I'm finding that a lot of um, uh, either angels or venture funds, they ask the, one of the first questions they ask you is if you're doing this full time. If you're not doing it full time, they are right away, it's pretty much, a, for sure it's a no. Almost like, so what, what do you suggest? If I can be flip and say craft dinner. <laughs> um, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's a real problem. There is a real shortage of, of capital, investment capital, for particularly for early stage ventures, uh, which makes that very difficult. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think Dave last week talked about credit cards. I mean, you know, there's many an entrepreneur that we know who has maxed out on credit cards. That's a, you know, that's a really huge risk. But in order, in order to keep food on the table, uh, just you know, that's uh, uh, where you do have access to credit. Self, so that's self-financing, high risk. Um, the old, as I say, friends, family, and fools, going back for just a little bit. We have lots of little companies that get some angel investors, and they almost limp from round to round. It's not a route that I recommend, but they go back and they raise another $100,000, and then that keeps people paid. Obviously, keep costs to an absolute minimum. That's a no-brainer. Um, I mean, I'm not saying anything that I don't think you probably haven't already thought of, but you're absolutely right. If you're not committed full-time, you'll be dismissed. Uh, and there's not a formula, and every venture yeah. is absolutely different, but you have to also recognize what you and your family can live with. Right, so if you're in some kind of relationship, can one partner support the other while they do this full time? What are the sacrifices? Because this is what it's about. It's about sacrifices in the short term. But there, like, there isn't a magic that says six months is it. Uh, I also would really suggest that you do uh, get an advisor that's going to tell it to you like it is. You don't want to just surround yourself by people who are telling you how great you are. Because as an entrepreneur, you better think you're great, but you also better be willing to listen to those that are giving you the hard reality. And, and Allison has touched on 
on a crucial point. I mean, this, this profoundly affects your partner in that. So marry a dentist or a doctor <laughs> is always good advice. Um, if you have one way, one successful way is people who have a job that they wish to leave, um, use that as a platform to salt away as much money as you possibly can um, before you make the leap. Um, so, you know, basically anticipate the draw, but as Allison said, get advice because, you know, the, the, the cliche, it'll cost you twice as much and take twice as long uh, before you get, uh, before you raise money. And just uh, one more side, small question. So what if, you know, in possibility of possibilities, friends, family, and fools, for whatever reason, is not an option. So you don't have family who could give you 10,000, because the capital is capital, like $5,000 is not a lot of capital unless you're running something really bootstrapping. Uh, like I said, the banks, if you go to that bank and say, I'm starting a business, they're gonna be like, amazing, have fun. Oh, we're not giving you money, by the way. Um, so, if, so can you, I mean, can you skip right to angels and s still be, you know, in a good space? Or do you have to sort of put in the work, do you find that it's like this is a specific linear route First to go to family and friends, then to angels, then maybe to VC after that. Getting anybody to invest, you have to sell them a story, basically. And, and there's, there's going to be lots of lectures on that. Fundamentally, you have to tell a story that convinces them to invest in you. If that story involves 10 years of working, you know, living on craft dinner, that's one thing. If it is a compelling business opportunity and you can articulate it well, the fact that you started up last week shouldn't matter. It's all about how compelling is the story and how committed you are to it. So again, no, no ready formula to that, but if it's a so-so story, it really doesn't matter how long you have been slaving at it. It's, it's not going to get anybody to, to invest. It's all about the strength of the opportunity that you're presenting to them. Yeah. And how long you've been at it is, to me, is a, is a secondary issue. So it's not unheard of, but there's an awful lot of competition for angel dollars as well. And you've got to be you know, the top of the top. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Allison, at the beginning of the at the beginning of the session, you mentioned the concept of the double bottom line and the triple bottom line. Uh, I'm familiar with the double, but not the triple. And also, uh, how do you come up with metrics for those other bottom lines? The first one's really easy. Uh, when you're trying to, how is it that when you're coming up with those other bottom lines, and the third one, I'm not even sure what environmental. that is. Environmental. Sorry. Environmental. Okay. So social and or environmental. Okay, um, so h how much of a challenge is it coming up with the metrics for those? It's one thing, dollars are dollars, and it's easy to, to, to draw hockey sticks and things like that. Uh, but h how, do you, how much of a challenge is it coming up with the metrics for those other two components? It's a great question. It's not easy. Um, nothing, none of this is easy. If this was easy, you wouldn't need us. You'd be sitting at home at your computer. Life would be good. Uh, social metrics are very hard. So we're working with groups like the Boston Consulting Group, for example, who looked at Pathways to Education, which is a, a program, you know, it started in Regent Park, and they've been able to show that for every dollar invested in Pathways to Education, which keeps kids in school and actually pays them to go on to post-secondary, for every dollar invested in that program, $25 are saved by the government. So that kind of uh, social return on investment metric is available to us and we're working not only with groups like Boston Consulting Group but also um, at some global initiatives. There's something called the Global Impact Investing Rating System and there's a lot of other national and international um, initiatives that we're trying to make sure that Canada is involved in. So again, not real simple but more and more there are metrics out there. And we actually have a, a social impact metric specialist at Mars who can help with that. But it's okay. still tough. Okay, well, just conscious of the time, we'll take these last two questions and then um, maybe Tony and Allison will stay if you have additional questions. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Jamie Zayuna, and actually uh, I started a, uh, a startup about two months ago. And about a month ago, I was laid off, so I've been putting all my, my efforts and money and time into this venture. Uh, I'm curious about copyright laws, and uh, if I'm coming up with an event uh, that's quite unique, how can I make sure that no one goes and kind of alters the name and, and uh, does what they wish from it? Um, I guess first thing I will say is we do have a session uh, specifically on intellectual property and copyright is, is one form. Uh, rather than ant attempting to answer that, what I would suggest is we have last year's lecture Yeah, um, We have online. a number of, of lectures, uh, videos online under Mars Best Practices. There's probably three and on the E101 online there's the old year's lecture that's an introduction as well as articles in the Entrepreneur's Toolkit. So once you've sort of brushed up on those types of things, I think that might be a question Question that you would speak to some a legal expert on yeah, your particular. But I think you can get a good. But you can get good a good overview from from, from our from speakers. That. Okay, and yeah. you said Tuesdays is free uh, legal advice. Somewhere in this building? Uh, yes, up at the Norton Rose uh, main floor. Uh, look for that uh, um, red uh, telephone booth. Um, I think it's Tuesday afternoon. I think afternoon. it's at lunch or some afternoon. There's, they, they have a they sign have a up. Sign. They have a sign. They have a the big window. sign. Yes, and it's, uh, it's part of our service provider network that agrees to provide a certain amount of free services. So go up, say you're with E101, say Allison sent you. <laughs> Absolutely, Perfect. Uh, Thank you. but it is it is good to think about it. It, it. it is was, but there are incredible resources on that website. So you get a very limited amount of time with that lawyer. So you want to have done your research first. So Do you your can homework. Ask the yes. question, right? Yeah, and then make maximum use. Good point. Thank you, everyone. Check out Tio's Eco Chase. Sorry, just had to plug in. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> See, it is me. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Khaled. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very good presentation. Um, I have a question about funding. Um, when you're asking for funding from investors, um, they're going to want to know where that money is going. And, so, and, and for some startups, um, there is a need for a special kind of talent. You need a, pe a person who has certain kinds of talents. And so if the money you're asking for is directly to recruit talent, is that something investors like, like or don't like? Or like, do, w w what kind of expectations do they have of where the money goes? If if it is a skill set that you don't have right, right. that is essential to the business, if you don't say that, you won't get the money. Uh, an investor, you know, it's, it is a sign of self-awareness to say, listen, I can't do this on my own. I, I can do this, I can do this. To, for this venture to succeed, I need this skill set, uh, and that's where your money will go with. That's a plus. That is absolutely a plus. I would say. Yeah, and there are lots of what we call founder syndrome, so people that are starting an organization and don't recognize that they don't have the talent to bring it to the next level, so you're already ahead of the game on that. Yeah. And of course, investors, they want the best people, so a lot of what we do at Mars as well is talent matching. So if you need a chief financial officer and that's not your strength, you know, you're really the innovator, then we can help you with that as well. Yeah. Lots of deals get turned down because investors say, no, this person yes, there's too much ego, they can't do it all, and they don't know that yet, and they're going to screw up. And so, no, uh, that's an execution failure. I'm not going to put my money in there because they're not willing to listen, and it'll cost too much money before they've failed and are willing to listen, pass, move on to the next. Remember, most VCs invest in one out of every hundred deals that they see. I don't know the stats for angels, but it's probably comparable. They, you know, we used to joke, you kiss a lot of frogs. Um, so there's huge competition for money. And uh, if you've got a weakness, don't hide it. Say, I can fix that with someone else. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony and Allison, for a great presentation.